So Lord, we thank you so much just for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you that you've brought us here this morning to study your word, um, that your word is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, that um, it effectively works in us better than anything else that we could study, better than anything else that we could do, Lord. It's your word that refines us. And so as we open up your word, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be teaching us the things that he desires to show us and that we would be listening and attentive. Lord, but that we wouldn't just be hearers of what your word says, but as we leave this place, we would be doers of what your word says. And so, Lord, I pray that you would be honored and glorified. Lord, I pray for anyone right now that may be suffering with discouragement or depression and and the enemy is just attacking them on every side. Lord, I pray they would look to you, the author and finisher of their faith. I pray that you would comfort them, Lord, as you've given them your Holy Spirit and you've called him the comforter, Lord. We know that you are near to the brokenhearted, Lord. And so we ask that you would encourage us and lift us up. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We're actually starting in verse 2 because we did uh, verse 1 last week um, as that kind of uh, went with the end of chapter 6. So starting in verse 2, Paul says, Open your hearts to us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have cheated no one. I do not say this to condemn, for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. Now, no one likes to repent. I don't don't think there's anyone that I know of that enjoys repenting. Like, oh, gee golly, I get to go repent right now. I can't wait to do it. Um... No one likes to repent because no one likes to really admit they're wrong. That goes everything against that our flesh tells us, right? Our flesh tells us we're right. Our bride tells us that you weren't wrong, they were wrong. You're the victim here. Or, or maybe it's the circumstances in your life. You don't need to repent. You don't need to be sorry. No one likes to admit that. No one likes to do that. But what is the other option if we don't repent when we sin? The other option is to live with your guilt and try and suppress it. I think every person knows that they're guilty. Paul in Romans 1 says that man, the world, suppresses the truth. They can clearly see there's a God by the creation out there. God has written on every man's heart morality, his his law. However, man decides to suppress that truth. To neglect that truth. Why? Because they don't want to repent. Repenting would be admitting they're wrong. And in today's day and age, that's impossible, right? But Paul here is going to show us what the importance of repentance is and what it looks like. See, there's a, there's a very important repentance is very important, but it also looks like something. And so Paul's going to go over that for us this morning. Now in these first three verses that we just read, verses two through four, Paul here is continuing to show that he love that he has for them. Um, this whole letter is a lot different than really every other, any other letter that we have written by Paul. Uh, most of the other letters written by Paul are letters of instruction there are letters where, where Paul is laying out doctrine for the church to understand and believe. They're letters of encouragement to the church. He might throw in some personal things. But Paul, one thing Paul doesn't like to do is really talk about himself. Right? He, he's actually mentioned before in his letters. He goes, look, in, in the letter to the Thessalonians, he says, look, we could come to you as apostles, but we don't do that. Or we could demand that you give us a place to stay and a weekly stipend for food and everyone in the church needs to take care of us and all these things. He goes, but we don't do that. You know, Paul wasn't the kind of guy that inter- every time he introduced himself to someone, he goes, I'm the Apostle Paul, the one you've probably heard about. <laughs> no. Um, Paul, when he would introduce himself, at least to us in the scriptures, he's the chief of sinners. He's the least of all the apostles. He goes, I mean, he goes, yeah, technically I'm an apostle, but I'm like pff, the last one you'd want to meet. <laughs> 
But this letter, 2 Corinthians, is very interesting because it's very personal. It's a letter where Paul is actually defending himself and defending his ministry. And, and not for the sake of himself, but for the sake of them. The church in Corinth. See, what had happened is Paul is the one who started the church in Corinth. He's the one who planted it. He's the one who was their spiritual father. Say, you know, spoke the gospel to them. A lot of them were saved under Paul's ministry and, and were ministered to under Paul's ministry. But then Paul left and he went to Macedonia. And when he left, some other people came in. And these other people really started to deny Paul and his ministry. They started to say, Paul really doesn't know what he's talking about. Paul's not really an apostle. You know, if he's an apostle, would he do this? If he's an apostle, why is he in jail? You know, sounds like a criminal to me, you know. If he's an apostle, why do people hate him? Why is it everywhere he goes, there's tribulations and trials? I mean, if he's an apostle, shouldn't he just have a golden path set before him because he walks the straight and narrow? I've seen personally friends and um, family members even who have been under someone in ministry and come to find out whether they were a fraud or they uh, was there a pastor who um, had to step down because of sin in their life. And I've seen the damage that does to people. Because they start to question everything that that person taught them or they experienced in that ministry. And they're just like, well, was it all a lie? And maybe you yourself have been in a situation like that. And, and, and it just makes you really question everything about your faith. And so Paul, when he's defending the ministry, he's not defending it for himself. Like, hey, I need to make myself look good because my donations have been going down lately from the Corinth church. And I need to send them a prayer shawl to make sure that they know that I'm praying for them. No, instead he's defending his ministry so that way they would be encouraged. So, hey, look, no, I've taught you the gospel. I've taught you the Word of God. And so in these first few verses, he's continuing to do that. He's continuing to show that love he has for them. He goes, open your hearts to us because at this moment in time, it seems that they were very shut off towards Paul. They wanted nothing to do with Paul. Paul, Paul showed love to them and that love wasn't reciprocated back to him and his companions. So he says, open your hearts to us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have cheated no one. I've mentioned this before. Interestingly enough, the one the um, verses used in Scripture to support paying a pastor are all from the Apostle Paul. Interestingly enough, Paul never took a check from a church. He said, "Look, I'm going to tell you. You know, you churches need to support your pastors." He goes, "But in my case, I don't want to corrupt anything, and so I'm not going to take a check. I'm going to work all day." in the square as a tent maker. Even when he took a collection for the saints in Jerusalem from the Gentile churches, he didn't go collect the money himself, but he sent Timothy to collect the money. Because he says, hey, look, I don't want, you know, I'm the one telling you to collect the money, but I don't want anyone thinking like, oh yeah, Paul just took it and, you know, took vacation to Spain or something like that. You know, he had to buy a private jet so he could travel around the world um, so he wouldn't be around those sinners. And he goes, hey, look, I'm not even going to collect the money. I'm going to send someone else to collect the money so that way they can bring it to the church in Jerusalem so no one can say that I've done something wrong. And it wasn't just him, but it was his companions, Silas and Timothy. They've corrupted no one. They've cheated no one. He did nothing wrong to them. Paul served them with a pure conscience. Not only that, but he says that, I do not say this to condemn, for I have said before that you were on our hearts to die together and to live together. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all of our tribulation. Now again, one of the things that these false teachers seem to be accusing Paul of was the fact that he's in trials and tribulations shows that he's not really an apostle. Would an apostle of God really have people against him? Jesus says, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. So yes, as a follower of God, we will have people against us. 
Hard times doesn't mean that that's not where God wants us to be. I used to, I used to think that. Like, well, I'll go down the path that's easiest because that's obviously where God wants me. <laughs> yeah, that's not the case. It's typically the opposite. I mean, read the book of Acts and you see the, the stuff that Paul went through. It was anything but easy. He should have hired, hired a travel agent. It would have made, made things a lot smoother for him. But instead he's, you know, shipwrecked and in jail and doing all these things. And he wasn't ashamed of those things. Verse 5. For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts. Inside were fears. Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comfort us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was comforted in you. When he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. Paul and his companions, they went to Macedonia when he was, he was in Macedonia writing this letter. And he experienced a lot of troubles there. Again, you read the book of Acts. Paul never had a, a very welcomed stay wherever he was. Whether it was a riot, whether he was being stoned, whether he was being put in jail, whether was, he was just being, there was plots to kill him and so they had to sneak him out in the middle of the night for his own safety. But he says here, he goes, when we came to Macedonia, we had no rest. But we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts. Inside were fears. Paul says he was troubled on every side. Outside conflicts, inside fears. Man, I cannot tell you what 2020 felt like, but that seems to sum it up. <laughs> right? A lot of times in our lives, outside conflicts, inside fears. I think probably every single one of us is at one point, maybe even, even if you're not right now, experiencing that. Outside conflicts, inside fears. But Paul here has a great promise when he tells us this. And again, this is Paul the Apostle speaking. Paul the Apostle, the one that met Jesus on the road to Damascus. The one who's written most of the New Testament. The one who's done all these great things for the Lord. And he says, outside conflicts, inside fears. I, I'm glad that, hey, hey, Paul, I understand that. I understand you. You know, you're not in your ivory tower. You know, when I was praying for 36 hours straight. No, you're <laughs> outside conflicts, inside fears. Paul, I, I, I know. And I think all of us are reading that saying, yeah, I know too. But he gives us this great promise in, in verse 6. Nevertheless, God, oh man. What a <laughs> Nevertheless, God. Outside conflicts, inside fears. Nevertheless, God. Outside, inside. That, that really encapsulates everything, doesn't it, right? You're either outside or you're inside. But I guess there's a third dimension to that. God. <laughs> Nevertheless, God. And this is a great promise, not just for Paul the Apostle, Nevertheless, God, who, well, because I'm an apostle, obviously he's done this for me. Maybe one day you'll get on my level. No, nevertheless, God, what does he say there? Verse 6, who comforts the downcast. Comforts the downcast. That's anyone who's downcast. Not comforts the downcast apostle. Not comforts the downcast who made sure they read their Bible every morning. Or made sure they made it, did enough prayers that day or tithed that week, or showed up to church that week, or shared the, the gospel with someone that week, but comforts the downcast. Anyone who's downcast, he says, nevertheless, God does that. God comforts the downcast. God's always there to comfort us when we are downcast. When we are conflicts on the outside, fears on the inside. And how did he do this? He actually did this by the coming of Titus. What, what he did was he, he, Paul knew that his stay, he, he wasn't super welcome in Corinth. So what does he do? He sends someone on his behalf, sends Titus. And they actually received Titus. They received him well. And he even says Titus was comforted. 
And I was comforted by the fact that not only you accepted Titus, but you comforted Titus. Another way the Lord comforts us is what Jesus says is that he's given us his Holy Spirit who he calls the comforter. He says, I'm going to leave you, but not as orphans. I'm going to send my spirit, the helper, the comforter. But see, that doesn't always mean, though, you know, we, we know that God comforts us when we're downcast. We have this promise right here. But that doesn't mean he always wants us to be happy-go-lucky. That doesn't mean, you know, God says, I, I want everything to just always be okay in your life. Let's read the next few verses. For even if I made you sorry, verse 8, with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you, your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Now, if you remember, we have 2 Corinthians here. But when you read First and 2 Corinthians, you actually get a timeline of the fact that this is Paul's fourth letter to the Corinthians. Two letters that we, we don't have. We have 1 Corinthians, which is technically 2 Corinthians. And 2 Corinthians, which is technically 4 Corinthians. But think, I'm, I'm thankful that the um, editors and the, the people who put the Bible together just said, let's make it easy and just make it first and second. <laughs> Imagine telling someone first time in church saying, turn to your Bible to 4 Corinthians and they're like, I only see two. <laughs> you know? But before the third letter, that's what we'll call it, the third letter is actually, Paul calls it a severe letter, a harsh letter. One where it was filled with rebuke. We don't know exactly what was written in it. We can kind of get a, 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 a feeling because the letter of 1 Corinthians was a, a, a letter of correction to the church in Corinth. Right? There was a guy that was sleeping with his stepmom openly in the church and no one was saying anything about it. And he says, yeah, that needs, something needs to be said about that. There were, there were people in the church service. The, the church service was being run disorderly. And they were just letting, you know, anything go. And God and Paul says, no, there needs to be order in the church. Their love feasts, their times of communion, people were just getting drunk. While there were others that hadn't even eaten yet. He says, yeah, uh, that's not going to happen. He says that they had no love. And he says the best spiritual gift to desire is love. But I guess after that, things got a little more severe. And he wrote them this letter. We, again, we don't know what was written in it, but it seemed to grieve Paul to even write it. But he eventually saw what it produced in them. It, I mean, Paul didn't want to write to them in a sorrowful and harsh tone. It's a lot like a parent. Uh, no parent enjoys disciplining their kids. At least a, a good parent doesn't enjoy disciplining their kids. You know, you're not happy to do it. But when you see the fruit, when you see your child repent, change their ways, then you're like, okay, I'm, I don't want to do that, but I'm glad that, that, that I did that because it changed their ways. They repented. This is the same thing with Paul. He writes this severe letter and he's kind of like, you know, I, it's like when you're sending that text and you're like, I you know, really don't know how they're going to receive this and you send it. Which, by the way, if you're going to send anything to anyone, give them a call. Go visit them. A text and an email is not the way to do it. I know it's 2021 and that sounds like I'm from, you know, the early thousands. Wow. Um, but, come on, we, we, we can do better than that. But, you know, you're sending that text. That's Paul writing a letter, sending a text, sending an email. He's not sure how they're going to receive it. And then all of a sudden you get that text back that says, you know what? You're, you're so right. I was out of line. I apologize. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to not do that again. And you're just like, <laughs> okay, I guess I am glad I sent that text. But the whole time, you know, you can't sleep. Maybe you sent it like right before you go to bed, whatever. Paul saw the fruit in it and he goes, 
Okay, actually, you know what? I'm glad that I wrote it. Originally I was grieved, but now I'm not because I see that it produced fruit of repentance. He goes, verse 9, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry. He's not like, oh, I'm so glad I made you feel like dirt. <laughs> he goes, I, I, that's not why I rejoice, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorrow in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Paul here says that there are two types of sorrow that we can have. We can have worldly sorrow and we can have godly sorrow. And he actually says one sorrow is good, one sorrow is bad. Godly sorrow, as he says here, leads to repentance. And what does repentance lead to? Repentance leads to salvation. Right? That's what he says in verse 10. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. A great example of this is David and Bathsheba. Right, David, we know, most of us know the story of David and Bathsheba. David's up on his roof. He sees a beautiful woman bathing while his men are at war. He asks about the woman, brings her in, and they say, oh yeah, she's Uriah's wife, one of your great soldiers. Well, David says, well, he's off at war, you know, and he decides to sleep with her, and she becomes pregnant. Now he's got a dilemma. And so he brings Uriah back and he says, hey, you know, why don't you go uh, spend the night with your wife? You know, you've been working hard on the battlefield. Why don't you spend the night with your wife trying to cover it up? Say, oh, no, it's your, you know, it's your baby, not, not mine. Well, Uriah, um, being a good soldier, says, you know, if, if my, my friends are out there on the battlefield and they're sleeping in tents, I'm not going to go sleep in my bed with my wife. No. Gets him to stay, gets him, ends up getting Uriah drunk. Uriah can't even get home. You know, tries, well, maybe if I get him drunk, he'll, he'll just go back home and spend the night with his wife. Doesn't work out. Finally, he has to get Uriah killed on the battlefield to cover it up. Well, it's months after all this happens that Nathan the prophet comes up to him and gives him this whole story about a rich man who has all these herds of sheep and his neighbor, a poor man, they have one sheep. But that sheep isn't just for, for food or clothing. That's actually like a little pet, you know. Their own little pet sheep, family sheep. And this rich man has someone come to stay with him. And he says, let's have a feast. And instead of taking from my herd, I'm going to take this, my, neighbor's poor, my poor neighbor's sheep, their only sheep that they have, and kill it. And David goes, find out who that man is. And that man ought to be put, you know, he just like starts going off like, you know, we need to find this guy. And what does Nathan say to David? David, that man is you. You are that man. Now, interestingly enough, right after that, what does David do? No, no, well, you know, um, you know, it, it was a, I, I was drinking that night. No, he repents. He repents. From that point on, yes, there was consequences for his actions. The, the son that he had with Bathsheba died. But the Lord kept him. Lord, he still had his kingdom. He still blessed his line after that. He was still called a man after God's own heart. But then worldly sorrow. See, worldly sorrow leads to guilt. And guilt leads to death. That's what he says in verse 10. But the sorrow of the world produces death. In Matthew chapter 27 we have the story of Judas. Starting in verse 3 of Matthew 27. It says, Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, see Judas had already um, betrayed Jesus. He had already gotten his 30 pieces of silver for Jesus. Seeing that he had been condemned, for some reason it seems that Judas didn't think he thought that maybe he was going to force Jesus' hand into kind of like taking over Rome if he got him arrested. Um, but he sees, oh no, Jesus is being condemned and he's about to die. It says that he was remorseful and he brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. You figure it out. That's not our problem. 
Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed, and he went and he hanged himself. It says here, that, interestingly enough, that he was remorseful. He was remorseful, but he wasn't repentant. He had sorrow for what he had done. But instead, that sorrow, what, did that sorrow lead to salvation? Did that sorrow lead to repentance? No, it led to a cover-up. He's like, hey, can you just take the 30 pieces of silver back and we'll call it even and you guys can stop like arresting Jesus? Like, no, but instead he, was, he felt guilty. He felt the worldly sorrow. And in his case, unfortunately, it actually led to physical death. It led to him hanging himself. See, God does not, believe it or not, God does not desire that we are condemned by our sin, but that we would be convicted by our sin. If God desired that we be condemned by our sin, then why would he have sent his son Jesus to die for us? Right? His son took on death for us and then he defeated that death for us. See, the point of discipline is not sorrow, it's not death, but it's repentance. The point of discipline is reconciliation. God wants to bring you back into communion with him. That's what he's been doing since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. He's been desiring to bring people back into communion with him. Not condemn them. The Bible actually says our own sins condemn us. It's not the desire of God that we be condemned and discouraged. But it's his desire that we be convicted and repent. And turn to Him. Why? Because it's only when we do that, it's only when we have a heart of humility that He'll change us. That He'll cleanse us from our sins. It's only when we have it that way. And then in verse 11, He's going to continue. He's going to show us what true repentance look like, looks like. For observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you? What clearing of yourselves? What indignation? What fear? What vehement desire? What zeal? What vindication? In all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Therefore, although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. He tells them here, this is what true repentance looks like. True repentance will produce fruit. It will produce a change. That's what John the Baptist preached. Repentance. Repentance that produced fruit. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Right, I, maybe you've, you've had someone apologize to you for doing something. I'm so sorry I did this. I'm repenting. And yet, right as they finish that breath, their next breath, they're doing exactly what they just repented of. Or, or maybe it's not right after, but it's right back to it. There's no change in their life. One way we can actually bear fruit worthy of repentance is what Jesus says. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. True repentance will cause a change. He says it produced diligence, clearing of themselves, indignation, fear, vehement desire, zeal, and vindications. True repentance also understands how costly grace is. True repentance isn't just, oh yeah, sorry Lord, uh, yeah, I'll try not to do it again. All right. Okay, what was I doing before that that caused me to do that? Oh, I'm going to go do that again. No, but it understands. He says it produced fear. 
godly fear. So many times we fall back into the cycle of sin because we don't, under, we don't have a godly fear. We don't fear God. We treat God as our magic genie. We just rub the lamp and we ask for a wish and He grants it. Or God, that friend that we can always fool into doing something for us. Or, the, or God, that timid person that will never stand up to us. You know, God even said that if your you know, friend sins against you, you have to forgive him 70 times, 7 times. And I know in the Bible that means always. So God always needs to forgive me. He doesn't have a choice. Brother, you don't understand grace then. You don't have a fear of the Lord. But he says about the Corinthians... You guys repented and it shows. And that's why I'm glad I wrote that harsh letter to you. <laughs> that's why I'm glad I spiritually spanked you. <laughs> because it produced repentance in you. Because of the things, because of the change, he was not sorry that he wrote them such a harsh letter. And he, and he says there in verse 12, I didn't write it for the sake of the person who did the wrong or the person who suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. He was also doing it to show them that I really care about you guys. If I didn't care about you guys, I wouldn't even write to you. I would just say, hey, that's their problem. I'll let the Lord deal with them. He says, no, I really care about you. And then verse 13, Therefore, we have been comforted in your comfort, and we rejoiced exceedingly more for the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For if in anything I have boasted to him about you, I am not ashamed. But as we spoke all things to you in truth, even so our boasting to Titus was found true. And his affections are greater for you as he remembers the obedience of you all. How, he, how with fear and trembling you received him. Therefore I rejoice that I have confidence in you in everything. Like any good parent, they rejoice when their children are doing well. Paul here says they rejoiced in the fact that they repented. They rejoiced in the fact that they received Titus. And they refreshed him. And when we see people repent, we should be comforted and rejoice. You look at the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus. He was constantly being hounded by the Pharisees because they were upset that prostitutes and tax collectors and fishermen were repenting. They were mad. Why are these people repenting, Jesus? Why are you healing these people? Instead of rejoicing. The Messiah has come. He's raising people from the dead. He's healing leprosy. He's casting out demons. Prostitutes are repenting. Tax collectors are repenting. But instead they're you know, on their high horses. How dare you let these people repent? I even have the story in where Jesus is teaching and um, the paralytic's friends open up the roof so that way they can let him down and Jesus can heal him and Jesus heals him. But before he does, he says, your sins are forgiven and the Pharisees are ripping their hair out, ripping their beards out. He says, who but God alone has the authority to forgive sins? And he goes, well, what's easier? For me to just say your sins are forgiven or for me to say to this man, rise up, take up your mat and walk. And he rises up, takes up his mat and walks. He says, if I can do that, I can forgive sins. Only God can do that. That's why. Jesus has this great parable in Luke 15, verses 8 through 10. He goes, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels over God, over one sinner who repents. Now that parable is a really interesting parable because the lady is, quite frankly, she's crazy. 
She's got 10 coins. She loses one. And what does she do? She flips over her whole house, is searching frantically for this one coin. And when she finds it, then she throws a whole, whole party. I mean, imagine like your friend calling you up saying, hey, we're having a, a, a get together at my house tonight. You want to come? Yeah, what's the occasion? That pen that I lost last week in my truck, I found it. Couldn't, I mean, you, you might have another pen, right? She had nine other coins. God says, when one sinner repents, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And quite frankly, we need to do that. We need to be rejoicing when people repent. Not second guessing their repentance. Not analyzing them. Oh, you repented? Oh, really? Or how could someone like you repent so easily? (laughs) It's not the case. We should be celebrating when someone repents. Now in closing this morning, when we sin... When, you, when we sin, we typically hear two different voices. One condemns us and puts us to death. One says, how dare you? You sinned. You deserve to die. That, that, that voice pushes you away from the Lord, right? That's the one that tells you, oh, you sinned? It's Saturday night and you sinned? You can't go to church tomorrow. You can't go there. That's the presence of the Lord. That's the people of the Lord. They don't want you in there. God doesn't, you're in time out from church, right? Or, or then you sin and you're like, you know what, Lord, I'm, I'm sorry. I just need to read my Bible. You can't read the Bible. God's not going to speak to you right now. He's giving you the cold shoulder because you sinned against him the third time this week, right? Don't, don't read your word. It's, it's, he's not listening. He's, he's not, or he's not speaking. Well, you know, I just need to pray to the Lord that he would just, um, change my heart because I'm just so sorry you can't pray to the Lord you know give him some space right now you just you just sinned against him give him some space and time you know maybe wait till tomorrow let him calm down that way he doesn't act out emotionally as if our God acts out emotionally right but we hear that right every time we sin we hear that pushing us away from the Lord Let me tell you right now, that is the voice of the devil. That is the voice of the enemy. That is the voice of your flesh. But then there's another voice, if you're a believer this morning. A voice drawing you closer to God when you sin. A a voice that is saying, boy, now more than ever, you need to get on your knees and pray. Because you've seen how weak you are and you need to be made strong. Now more than ever, open up his word and be refreshed and filled with, Go to church. Be amongst the fellowship of the saints. Don't neglect that. Go be encouraged by someone. Go use the gift that God has given you to encourage and and profit others. See, one condemns you to death while the other convicts you to life. One pushes you away from the Lord and one pushes you toward the Lord. See, it's okay to be sorrowful if that sorrow leads to repentance. And it's okay to be sorrowful because we know we have this promise here this morning. Nevertheless, God who comforts the downcast. See, this morning, maybe you are conflicts on the outside, fears on the inside. Or maybe that's just something, maybe, maybe this morning it's not that way, but maybe next week it's going to be. And you're going to hear the enemy telling you all these things. And ultimately it's just leading to death. But if you're a believer and you have the Holy Spirit, you have A, His comforter, His helper. You also have the Holy Spirit convicting you and leading you and guiding you. And He is leading you to life and life more abundantly. The only thing the world can do is condemn us to death. See, the enemy, what does he do? He roams around seeking whom he may seek, kill, and devour. His only purpose is death. Where God's purpose is life. And maybe God's even right now, he's 
He's written you a harsh letter, a severe letter. He's convicting you about things in your life right now that you need to change. That you're there. I should say that you need to allow him to change because you can't change it. You've tried changing it and it never worked. He's asking you right now to repent, to turn to him. He wants to produce that godly sorrow in you so we can make you more like him. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you love us and care enough for us that you will write these harsh letters to us. You will convict us by your Holy Spirit, Lord. But I pray when that conviction comes, it's not towards death for condemnation, but it would be towards life. Lord, I ask that right now, if there's anyone who is being convicted of something, I pray right now they wouldn't leave their chair without repenting. We ask that you would work in their life. Lord, as you fill them with your spirit, your spirit comforts them. They're not to be condemned by their sin anymore. We're no longer held under our sin. We're no longer known as thieves, liars, and murderers. We're now known as children of God because of the work that you've done. And so, Lord, continue to do that work in our life. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who doesn't know you. Lord, all they've been is condemned by the world and they're just trying to suppress it. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would free them of that condemnation, that they would repent and turn to you because it's through repentance that leads to salvation. We can't have salvation without repenting. And so, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would do his work. Fill us this, this week. Lord, I pray for anyone who maybe right now is downcast, that you would comfort them. I pray for many of us who this week as we go out will become downcast. I pray we remember that you are there to comfort us. You're near to the brokenhearted. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.